symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Turn it on and rip the knob off. Guys, and welcome back to the Wrestling Memory Grenade, episode number 108, and I am feeling great. Why, Ray, you may ask? Well, first of all, I'm here with you guys. It's always a good time. But second of all, this is it, the final episode of the 1987 in the WWF Project here this week. Going to close out the month of December. Look at the final two weeks of WWF TV in 1987, including the Slammy Awards. How about that, guys? But yes, right around the corner. Next week, in fact, Thanksgiving week here in the States, guys. A little Black Friday holiday present for everyone. Well, it's not dropping on Friday, but Black Friday's not really Friday anymore. You guys know what I mean. Next week on The Grenade, episode number 109, we begin the new year. Yes, 1988 in the World Wrestling Federation, and it's all going to kick off with Saturday night's main event. But before we can get there, we got to get through the end of 1987, guys, and I have a feeling that we can do it this week. But this is it, the end of the road for 1987. What a fun year it has been. Started off by setting the stage, going back into 1986, looking at all of the pieces that were turning heading into 1987. And of course, we got that epic feud between Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan to kick off the new year. Lots of great storyline in place for that one. We said goodbye to Rowdy Roddy Piper. Hey, we covered the definitive edition of WrestleMania 3. I know new listener Gene Jackson just got through WrestleMania 3, and thank you for the kind words. Put a lot of heart and time into that dual piece episode of The Grenade way back when. And for those who haven't heard it, I encourage you to go back and check it out. WrestleMania 3 here on The Grenade. And if you've heard it before, hey, it's worth listening to twice, guys. I promise you. But the year went on and all sorts of new stars, a new influx of talent began to seep into the World Wrestling Federation. Names like, yes, we've seen the Ultimate Warrior as of late, but also Ravishing Rick Rude, Bam Bam Bigelow. Remember, Demolition was formed at the beginning of 1987. So many big names have entered here, including the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. Now we know he has issued Hulk Hogan an opportunity of a lifetime, offering WWF champion Hulk Hogan millions of dollars to purchase that WWF title away from the champion. And this week here on The Grenade, guys, the cliffhanger is over, as the champion will indeed address the question. Yes, as this week, the champion Hulk Hogan will indeed not only address the Million Dollar Man's offer, but he will answer the question that's on all of our minds. Does indeed everybody have a price for the Million Dollar Man? Stay tuned and find out, guys. But as we get rolling this week, just a friendly reminder that you can listen to the Wrestling Memory Grenade and our sister shows like the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. Currently, yes, we're covering Georgia 81, UWF 1986, but coming soon to the Regional Wrestling Project, very soon, it's Memphis. Yes, indeed, the CWA Memphis Wrestling back in 1985 being added to the Regional Wrestling's list of projects. I'm also working on research to cover the 1970s and the old LaBelle Los Angeles territory as well. So stay tuned, guys. Lots of great things coming over there on Regional Wrestling. You can also listen to Monday Warfare, The Battles Within, talking all about that weekly episodic story we now know as the Monday Night War. Doing it one week at a time over there on Monday Warfare. It's the WWF versus WCW. New episodes coming very soon. Of course, as I hope everybody knows by now, you can also listen to the brand new podcast, The Wrestling Stoop with the wrestling legend himself, Bob Roop. Already got a couple of shows out there in the books. Lots of great feedback there. And the third episode dropping this week, the Wrestling Stoop with Bob Roop. And this week, Bob's going to tell some really great Terry Funk stories. So you guys don't want to miss that. I'm also happy to announce, doing something interesting here with the WrestleCopia brand, guys. The Memphis Continental Wrestling Podcast, the UK's number one and only podcast focused on Memphis wrestling. And I talked about doing 1985 on the Regional Wrestling Podcast. Well, 
the Memphis Wrestling Cast, coming to the WrestleCopia brand, part of the Place to Be Podcast Network. Host Luke Jennings is going to bring you guys some 1984 Memphis goodness. Now, you won't find me on his program. This is actually Luke's program from the Place to Be, but I extended the offer. I appreciate his hustle, everything he's trying to put out there, everything he's trying to do. I said, hey, Luke, would you like to maybe showcase your 1984 Memphis project he has upcoming on WrestleCopia? And of course, Luke, he said, absolutely, Ray. So we will be adding him to our list of shows, which you guys can find over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met. From Apple to Spotify, Google and beyond, guys. And be sure to follow me on social media. It's very crucial at this point in time to follow me on social media for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, because guess what? We've still got more coming, more surprises on the way, guys. And you can follow me on Twitter, or now it's X. You can follow me there at Rasslin' Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Rasslin' Grenade. And subscribe to my YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Rasslin' Grenade. Remember what I said before about uploading all of the UWF and 1986 shows in chronological order? to coincide with the Regional Wrestling Project. Well, we're going to be doing the same thing with the 1985 Memphis So, and I'm talking pretty deep here, not just the studio show, but the arena shows that were aired out of Jackson. And yes, even many, many episodes of the infamous Jerry Lawler Show, which aired Sunday morning on local Memphis TV. Jerry Lawler doing his own talk show of sorts. So for those of you unfamiliar, there's a few of them up right now. You can go check it out under the 1985 Memphis playlist over at youtube.com slash wrestling grenade. Subscribe today. And last but certainly not least, especially heading into the holiday season, actually this week, guys, I had to have my laptop repaired. Cost me a few bucks. So it would be a great time if you could take into consideration becoming a WrestleCopia patron. You can find me there at patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That address again, patreon.com slash wrestle C-O-P-I-A, talking about that $5 all-access tier. Get you all sorts of gifts for just 5 bucks, including all of my insanely detailed book-like show notes, guys. Talking pages and pages of show notes for every episode of The Grenade Show, Monday Warfare, and the Regional Wrestling Podcast. And remember, UWF notes, Georgia 1981 notes, and now coming soon, Memphis in 1985 show notes coming as well. You'll also get early access to many of the podcasts here on WrestleCopia, where you can listen days and sometimes as much as a week earlier than the rest of the listeners. Plus, remastered versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade Show, covering the old 1989 NWA project. Includes enhanced sound quality, plus new content and conversation that were originally edited out of the initial broadcast due to time restraints, edited right back in. But that's not all. You also get digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure. I've been told by more than one patron that the digital downloads are worth the $5 price alone. Plus, random bonus video drops and, of course, our Patreon-exclusive watch-along series covering many past WWF and WCW pay-per-views, Coliseum videos, Saturday Night's main events, Clash of the Champions, and so much more. And you get all of that for the low, low price of just $5. No subscription. Cancel any time. Please show your support. Give it a try for a month. I think you'll like the content that we offer, and every penny of it goes into paying the bills here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. So please, if you have a few bucks to spare, you're looking to support that next up-and-coming podcast brand, please consider making it WrestleCopia. So if you can, help me pay some of these bills to keep the WrestleCopia Podcast Network up and running for the months and the years to come. All right, guys, and with all of that out of the way, it's time to jump back into things one last time here in the year of 1987, heading into the holidays. God, would I love to be a kid again. But instead, we'll have to make do and head back to the World Wrestling Federation one final time here in 1987, and it all starts off with the December 19th edition of the Superstars of Wrestling. All right, and here we are, Superstars of Wrestling, December 19th, 
Tape back December 9th, not too long ago. Tampa, Florida at the Sun Dome. It's Vince McMahon, Jesse Ventura, Bruno San Martino, all on the call. And it's Slammy Weekend, y'all. The Slammy Awards going to air tonight, in fact. December 19th, check your local listings. Late night airing, the 37th annual Slammy Awards coming soon. And yes, guys, as we close out this week's TV, we will talk just a little about the Slammy Awards. But first, here it is, superstars. We head off to the ring for the Macho Man, Randy Savage, taking on Steve Lombardi. As Jesse Ventura again pointing out that he's always been the supporter for the Macho Man's ability, not like those Johnny-come-latelys Vince McMahon and Bruno. Jesse says that Savage is filled with talent. Vince replies, Elizabeth's filled with talent too. Yeesh, Vince. But the crowd pumped up here for the Macho Man, who delivers a double axe handle out to the floor, and then one back inside as well before the flying elbow. Going to finish off Lombardi in just 2 minutes and 24 seconds. Yet another win for the Macho Man. As we head off now to update with Craig DeGeorge, Craig going to tell us just a little bit about those slammies. From the pages of the World Wrestling Federation magazine, here's Update with Craig DeGeorge. Hello, everyone. The entire country is buzzing. There's a fervor, excitement in the air as we get set for this weekend's premier television event, the Slammy Awards. And by the way, be sure to check your local listings for airtime in your city. You don't want to miss this event. Originating from Caesars in Atlantic City, the Slammys promises to be the greatest award show in the history of sports entertainment. And if you ever wondered what would happen if a bunch of wrestlers showed up at a black tie award ceremony, well, dream no more. Unusual and original award presentations are what the Slammys are all about. It's the Slammy Awards, television's premier sports entertainment awards show. More grandiose than the Grammys, more elaborate than the Emmys, more ostentatious than the Oscars. The Slammys promises to be a night of song, a night of dance, a night of hams, and a night of slam. Join Hulk Hogan and all the gang for the Slammy Awards. Here on WTF TV 29, Philadelphia, tonight at 11.30. All right, the quintessential television award show, the Slammys, this weekend. With Update, I'm Craig DeGeorge. Yes, indeed, they're coming tonight, the Slammy Awards. As we hear Vince McMahon there doing the voiceover plug for the show, which is more grandiose than the Grammys, more elaborate than the Emmys, and more ostentatious than the Oscars, pal. Can't wait to get to the Slammy Awards, but for now, it's back to the ring for the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, bodyguard Virgil by his side, taking on Rick Hunter. As DiBiase now apparently making his winter residence in the Netherlands Antilles. Boy, they are not fucking around with this character. How many houses does he have? As the match gets going, DiBiase clubbing Hunter down early on, but the grizzled veteran Hunter, he ducks a wild swing by Teddy and backdrops the Million Dollar Man. How about that? Pair of big body slams from Hunter as well, but it is the Million Dollar Man right back on top, eating Hunter alive, very aggressive here in the early stages of the Million Dollar Man character is Ted DiBiase, and it's the falling back elbow off that middle rope impresses Bruno every time. DiBiase going to pick up the win one minute and 49 seconds, and then post-match, the Million Dollar Man grabbing the house mic. Now, he's been telling us for weeks that everybody's got a price, and later in the program, he's going to prove to everyone that even Hulk Hogan has his price for the Million Dollar Man. Well, we'll just have to wait and see about that. But for right now, it's promo time. As we head off to Craig DeGeorge, he's talking with the Hammer, Greg Valentine. For Valentine, and he is gunning for the championship again, and now you will be doing it with a different manager. You have Jimmy Mouth of the South Heart. A lot of things have happened to you, Hammer, in 87. Oh, yes, and you know, I've had to change directions. Had to do a lot, a lot of thinking. And I signed that big multi-million dollar contract with Jimmy Hart. You know, so I'm more excited about that than any of the previous championships that I've had in the World Wrestling Federation. Intercontinental Championship, one half of the World Tag Team Championship. Oh, by the way, along with Brutus the Barber Beefcake. <laughs> but you know something, Craig DeGeorge, if you ever watch some of those matches, take the, uh, t- why don't you watch some night, WrestleMania 2. Watch where we lost the belts, where the belts were stolen from us, from the British Bulldogs. I wrestled the Bulldogs all by myself. Hadn't it been for Beefcake, 
fruitcake. You know, he didn't do anything to help me out. That's why we lost the belts. And that's why I went downhill because of Brutus the Barber Fruitcake. And he went around on a mad crusade all of a sudden. He's calling himself a barber. Shaving everybody's head. He is licensed. All the way. villains. <laughs> licensed. A mad crusade to shave all the villains' hair in professional wrestling. Well, let me tell you something. This is one of the biggest and the baddest villains in the World Wrestling Federation today. And yeah, I'll admit it. I don't care about those fans. I don't care about those people sitting out there watching me wrestle. All I care about is that they buy a ticket. That's all I care about, Beefcake. And all I care about is making some money so I can build that big house on that big hill and drive that big car. That's all there is to life anyway, man. If you're looking for something else, Bruce Cake, you're barking up the wrong, wrong tree. You're going around telling everybody that you got a soft heart, that you're such a great person, that you're a real goody two-shoes. Well, now you're going to have to show everybody if you're a man or not. And I don't think you are. I don't think you're a man enough to beat the hammer. In fact, uh, I know you're a not. A man who indeed has different values, the hammer, Greg Valentine. The hammer seamlessly moving out of the new dream team, not feuding with Dino Bravo, thank God. But he is indeed feuding with his former partner, Brutus the Barber Beefcake. However, next time Hammer probably looking to put the barber down for good when he once again applies that figure four. And then it's back to the ring for The Rock, Don Morocco, Dusty Wolf in his corner. And we get an insert promo here from the Natural Butch Reed, the One Man Gang, and the Slickster. Reed and Slick warning Morocco. Don saw what they did to Superstar Graham. They'll do the same to The Rock if he gets in their way. While Vince McMahon marvels at Morocco's ridiculously vascular hoses, dude, all in his upper body, the chur points out how Don is also trimmed down in the waist, which has allowed him to become much quicker in the ring. Hadn't even noticed that, Jesse. Good point. As The Rock drills Wolf down with a big power slam and a trifecta of swinging neckbreakers. Wow. Atomic drop and back suplex combination from The Rock here before Morocco going to finish Wolf off with the tombstone pile driver. Quick win, 1 minute and 18 seconds. Don Morocco, successful heading into the new year. As we are off now, Mean Gene Oakland standing by with one of my favorite teams of all time. It's Axe and Smash Demolition. All right, stay tuned. There's more action right around the corner. Mr. Fuji, Osaka, Japan. What a career this man has had. Now one of the premier wrestlers in the World Wrestling Federation. You and I, sir, have not always seen eye to eye, but at this time of the year... I want to wish you and yours a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs> Thank you very much. But in my country, we do not have Merry Christmas. It's only for you Americans. My Merry Christmas is to make people suffer. Oh. And think about Mr. Fuji and the demolition when they demolish every opponent that comes forward. At this time of the year, Mr. Fuji, yes, how yes, can you be yes, thinking such yes, evil yes. thoughts? Yes. You are a sick man. Thank you very much. <laughs> what about it, Smash? Well, like Master Fuji says, we make people suffer. In fact, the other day, Master Fuji let us get a Christmas tree. It was a big leather, like a coat, with steel balls on. And each ball weighed about 20 pounds apiece. And he says what's going to make me very happy is when you destroy somebody, we can throw these steel balls through cars, through buildings. We can do anything we want, and we will. This came off a Christmas tree? You've got to be kidding me, Axe. He had to go all the way to San Francisco on special order. Everybody's happy. Everybody's excited about the past year. Everybody's joyous because of prosperity. Well, demolition's mad. We're upset because everybody's been avoiding us. 1988, Master Fuji said, we're going to get our opportunity. 1988, it's going to be our year. Why? Because we finally cornered the strike force. You're not going to be able to hide anymore. You can't say we're not worthy opponents. You can't say you're not ready for us. Because you bragged about holding the championship belts. You bragged about the fact that you're fighting champions. You're not warring champions. You've been in fights, but you've never been in a war. We want the tag team belts. We want the gold. We want the recognition. You walk around with them, but polish them up because we're going to take them. 
<laughs> All right, so book, excuse me. I thank you, Mr. Fuji. Axe and smash from demolition. <laughs> you like torture. You're a sick man. This is the holiday season. <laughs> Stay tuned, folks. We're going to be right back. Thank you. What can you say about demolition other than how awesome? I know some people out there, they're stuck in the NWA world that the demos were roadie ripoffs. And I see your point. You could go that way, but I just never saw it that way. Yeah, there were some spikes on both sides. Yes, there were some face paint on both sides, but still to me, very different in the presentation. And I loved me some demolition growing up. And it's so cool to see them evolve over this year of 1987 and only bigger and better things to come for the demos in 1988. As from there, we go on. We hear some fans commenting on the upcoming Slammies. Apparently everybody waiting with anticipation, waiting with bated breath, so to speak. And then we go off to the ring for the Hart Foundation. That's the former Tag Team Champion Hart Foundation with Jimmy Hart in their corner, taking on Omar Atlas and Outback Jack. Could it be Outback relegated to job guy status now? As we get an insert promo here from Jimmy Hart, he says all he wants for Christmas is his two tag team titles back for the Hart Foundation. Is Outback Jack going to start the matchup trading some shots with the anvil early on, but Neidhart wins the battle but misses an elbow drop, and Jack finally able to tag out to Omar Atlas. Omar in, and not very successful, and it's the heart attack. Going to give the Hart Foundation the win. Two minutes and 58 seconds. The Hart's looking to regain those tag team titles from Strike Force. As we are off now, we've been waiting for it, guys, all week long. We know the offer's been there for several weeks now. Will the WWF champion Hulk Hogan sell out to the Million Dollar Man? Well, the time for talking is well. The time for talking starts right now as we're off to a special interview up on the platform. Craig DeGeorge standing by with the WWF champion Hulk Hogan, and the big question: Will he sell his WWF championship to the Million Dollar Man? Ladies and gentlemen, indeed, for weeks the suspense has been building, and as we have heard from Ted DiBiase time and time again. Well, he says everyone has a price. Recently, the Million Dollar Man said that everyone includes the World Wrestling Federation heavyweight champion, Hulk Hogan. So right now, let us end all of our speculation. Please welcome the World Wrestling Federation heavyweight champion, Hulk Hogan! And I know, Jesse, your ears are very keenly awaiting the result. He's nodding yes already. Champ, your comments, please. Well, you know, thinking about money 24 hours a day can make you a little goofy, you know. I thought about how it would turn my life around if I had all the money I wanted. It would change me completely. I could have a new car in every garage. I could take care of my family any way I wanted to. Accepting the offer from the Million Dollar Man, oh yeah, it would make all this possible. I could do all that and more. New cars, family would be set up. I'd never have to fight for anything again. Accepting this offer from the Million Dollar Man would also change a few other things. All those little teeny hulksters that physically aren't as capable as me, I could help them out. All those little teeny hulksters that mentally aren't right on the money, we can help them out. And oh yeah, man, accepting the offer from the multi-million dollar man would change my life around completely. Thinking about that, thinking about all the little hulksters, thinking about all the money we could have, how easy it would be on behalf of all the little hulksters and myself, I'm gonna have to tell the million dollar man Ever after. I think he's a fool. He made the wrong choice. I think he made the right choice. 
So there it was. Enter Hulk Hogan to a big pop from the fans as the Hulkster admits he's been kooky thinking about money 24 hours a day, brother. All the cars he could buy. Really, that's where you go to first, Hulk. And making sure his family's set for life, dude. Now, mind you, he put them in that order. Car first, family second. Hell, Hulkster says he could even help all the little Hulksters that may need the help. Right, because that's what you do with that cash. So Hulk mulling it over. I could take care of myself. I could take care of my family. I could even take care of the little Hulkamaniacs out there. So could it be? Has Hulk Hogan sold out to Ted DiBiase? Well, I wouldn't blame him. Hogan then looking down at the belt, building the suspense. As he says on behalf of the little Hulksters and Hulk Hogan himself, he answers to Ted DiBiase's offer to buy the WWF world title. And that answer was... Hell no! Hell no, brother! So after a huge pop from the fans, Hogan then informs DiBiase if he wants the title belt that bad, he can step in the ring and try and take it, dude. Now, mind you, this is only the beginning of a much longer storyline all the way into WrestleMania 4 and beyond. But in itself, it was well built up over multiple weeks. Teddy says he can buy anything. And we wondered for a few weeks here, could it be so? But apparently, he can't buy Hulk Hogan. He can't buy the WWF title, it would seem. For now. Likely won't sit well with the Million Dollar Man. We'll just have to wait and hear his response as the show continues on, what we follow up a major angle with highlights, or maybe lowlights, of the recent Sam Houston versus Danny Davis rematch from Wrestling Challenge last week. Remember we talked about it? They were in and out of the ring five times, leading to a countout. Jimmy Hart aiding Davis with the megaphone, blasting Sam Houston. Houston eating the countout loss, but running Davis off after the matchup. And that's where we are in the epic Sam Houston-Danny Davis feud here this week, guys. As we're off to the ring now, Jake the Snake Roberts taking on Brian Costello using this match to promote the Slammies is what they're doing on commentary here as Jake clotheslines Costello off the apron. Great spot. And once back inside, Jake landing those patented jabs, short arm clothesline, and the DDT. Going to give Snake the win. Two minutes and 22 seconds. And of course, we get a little Damien after the matchup. And hey, maybe we've turned over a new leaf for the new year because Outlaw Ron Bass, now on syndicated TV. How about that? Only took about a year to get the outlaw back on syndicated. But here we go. It is Ron Bass taking on Tio Samoa. Tio Samoa. Think about how lazy and ridiculous that is, guys. Hi, my name's Bob United States. Yeah, yeah, I know. Samoa Joe. Well, Samoa isn't Joe's last name. Hi, I'm Jack Australia. Pleased to meet you, mate. I don't know. Anywho, Tio, actually a veteran of the rings, had partners like Reno Tafuli and Chief Tapu in previous years, and he's more trimmed down here in 87. I don't know that I've ever seen Tio from 1987 forward. I know he did some work in the ICW in the early 80s. He would go on. He did a little bit in Alabama there when Kevin Sullivan was booking. But it's very interesting to see him here on WWF TV near the end of 87, heading into 88. And he's looking good, but it doesn't help him here as the outlaw just pummels Samoa down as we see a shot of Miss Betsy, the bullwhip hanging over the corner buckle, and Bass's pedigree-like finisher. Going to get the quick win, just 1 minute and 58 seconds. The Outlaw scoring the win over Tio Samoa. And then post-match, Ron Bass whipping Tio with Betsy across the back before exiting the ring. And I don't know the last time we saw Bass on syndicated TV, but this, this could be your early Christmas present, guys. As the action continues on, it's time for the Birdman. Coco Beware taking on... Wow, another true veteran here in Raul Mata. And just mentioned Tio Taylor in the previous match being a veteran. How about Raul Mata? A tremendous star on the West Coast back in the 1970s. Just ask Dave Meltzer. And Pile Driver, the theme music, playing the Birdman to the ring. Not really interest music to me. Kind of slow, but I get it. Gotta sell the album. As we get an insert promo here from the Birdman talking all about the Slammy Awards and singing Pile Driver live on the program. And as the match gets going, Raul Mata proving that he can still take some great bumps all throughout this matchup as the Birdman going to deliver the middle rope fist drop. Shout out to King Lawler and the Ghostbuster Brainbuster gets the win for the Birdman. Coco beware in just two minutes flat. 
And before we close out Superstars, got another soundbite queued up for you guys. You're going to love this one. It's Mean Gene Oakland standing by with one of his favorites, Bobby the Brain Heenan. All right, it's not going to be long now. Tonight from Atlantic City, the 37th Annual Slammy Awards from Caesars and Circus Maximus. Bobby Heenan, come on in. There's going to be an award in your honor tonight called the Bobby the Brain Heenan Scholarship Award. Even though I'm going to be hosting the program, I'm very curious. I want to know what, what that scholarship award is all about. Well, first of all, pal, I'm going to walk away with everything. Now, the scholarship award named after myself, Bobby the Brain Heenan, is for high achievement and in intel in intellectual ability. Hmm. I mean, I'm talking about some of the people I run with, their IQs, it's up there. Mensa. No, no, those people are too old. I'm talking about some super smart people. And there's a lot of people in the running for this award. You mean that have higher IQs than the Mensa people? Higher IQs than the Mensa people. And guess what? Some pretty smart cookies. You're not in it. You're not up for it. Well, You're I'm not smart enough. I'm also I'm up for manager of the year. Manager of the year. Yep. You got some pretty stiff competition there piece of cake. Jimmy Hart, Mr. Fuji. Then I'm up for commentator of the year. Commentator of the year. Commentator of the You're year. You're up for commentator of the year? Yes, I'm up for commentator of the year. You're going to be kidding me. My man Rick Rude is up for the Jesse the Body Award for great physiques. Oh, you two guys are in bed together. You should I be mean, able to swing that. Ha, I'm going to walk away with everything here. And I understand you're up for a category. That video you did, Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo. Oh, Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo, thank you. Gene, can I... Uh, Stop all down right now and tell you something between what? you and I. You could be honest with me. Some Love people it. say it's not bad. Uh, I get, that's wrong. the word I get at the country club. They're I don't wrong. Know it's stunk. What are you saying, Bobby Heenan? I should just be spending my time at the crap table tonight? So instead of going to the slimies? That's tonight, 11 o'clock, right here on Fox Channel 5. So there it is. Hyping up the Slammy Awards tonight. Manager of the Year? Commentator of the Year? I got to be honest with you. I don't know that either of those are an actual category, Bobby. So as we conclude this episode of Superstars, by way of wrestling, obviously not much to phone home about. But the Hulk Hogan response was iconic as he told the Million Dollar Man, Hell no. Hell no! And as you guys might expect, Ted DiBiase going to have to rethink his strategy on acquiring the WWF title. As we continue on now, guys, it's off to Wrestling Challenge for December 20th. All right, it's Wrestling Challenge, December 20th, tape back December 10th, Fort Myers, Florida at the Lee Civic Center. And the now in a neck brace, Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon joining us for commentary here as we head off to the ring for the Young Stallions, Jimmy Powers and Paul Roma, taking on the credible enhancement team of Rick Renslow and Dave Wagner, but lots of arm work to start in basics by the Stallions who do manage to work in a little double teaming early on. And I know Renslow and Wagner, if you guys are watching this along with me, they don't look like much visually. But they are usually pretty solid in the ring, especially when they're teaming, but looking a bit off tonight, especially Rinslow, taking really awkward bumps. Not sure if he's injured or what the deal is here. As Jimmy Power is going to miss a dropkick and Rinslow going right after his leg, but failing to realize that Powers had made the tag to partner Paul Roma. And as Rinslow bends over to grab hold of Powers, it's Roma off the top rope with a sunset flip, taking Rinslow down and the Young Stallion scoring the win. Three minutes and 16 seconds. As we continue off to Special Report with Craig DeGeorge, it's more Craig shilling the Slammy Awards. And I promise, guys, we're getting there. We're going to get to the Slammys after we finish up this week of TV. But for right now, it's back to the ring for Ravishing Rick Rude with manager Bobby Heenan. Good to see Bobby back ringside as he takes on Outback Jack. Now, this is usually where we would see Luscious Johnny V step in for Bobby Heenan's absence on commentary. But with Valiant removed from TV, it's just Gorilla Monsoon flying solo here for this Rick Rude matchup as we get an insert promo from Rude, who expects to win the Jesse the Body Award this weekend at the Slammys. And, and I look up and I say, Rude and Outback Jack in the ring together. Now, there's a match you'd never expect to see, but here we are. Rude gets control first, but Jack comes firing back with some big right hands, but Outback runs right into a Rude boot in the corner 
and as the Ravishing One again takes over, he picks up the big Outback Jack over his shoulder. Impressive body breaker here. Gets the submission win in just 1 minute and 31 seconds. So I think that solidifies it. Puts the nail in the casket for Outback Jack doing a job here in just 90 seconds. And I got to tell you guys, remembering Rude's run off of memory, I thought it took him a little time to get over to the level that we know that he will. Perhaps a little slow going in 1987. That's what I remembered. But honestly, he's got this shtick down pat already. And he's had some great heat from the fans heading into the new year. So I stand corrected. Rick Rude got over a little quicker at a higher level than I thought. Kudos to Ravishing Rick. As we are off now to Mean Gene Oakland standing by with the Hart Foundation and their manager, Jimmy Hart. All right, hi again, everybody from the World Wrestling Federation. From all of us, I want to extend to you and yours a very happy holiday season. And, uh, of course, a real happy new year. I know 1988, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a great one, especially here in the World Wrestling Federation. Jimmy Hart, in a way, you kind of ended 1987 on a bit of a sour note when uh, your tag team champions in Syracuse, New York, were defeated by the strike force. And I know things have not been real good in the Hart Foundation as of late. You know, I heard that remark you made a couple of weeks ago because we watched TV, too, when you said the Hart Foundation have a brand new TV series out called The Whiners. We're not whiners if we don't complain. We have open right contracts now. against anybody. I'm telling you right now. You're whining right down. It's I a perfect not. example of and the way you handled yourself. You know, you know, a you lot of right. children out there right. will have presents under their Christmas trees. Yeah. A lot of them. All kinds of them wrapped up in packages. Presents they really want want inside. How would you children like those presents to be taken from you, yeah. taken out from under your tree, and to get absolutely nothing for Christmas? So that's what I've got to say. Merry Christmas! Brett, the hitman heart. It's a bit of, it's had a bit of a sour note at the end of the year. Yeah, you're right. And we're bugged by it, sure. It's going to be a rotten Christmas for the Heart Foundation, yes. But you know what I think? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And the Hart Foundation, we aren't going to split up, and we're not going to fade away or anything like that. We're going to rebound. We're going to bounce right back. And we're going to take the strike force, and we're going to pick them apart, and we're going to win those belts back, because we rightfully own them. We are the best in the world. And I know one thing. If you are the best in the world, all you have to do is go out there and prove it. And the Hart Foundation have done it before, and we're going to do it again. <laughs> I understand, Jimmy Hart, that you have signed contracts for the Hart Foundation to meet the strike force already. That's right. Anytime, any place, anywhere. That was then, and this is now. And these will be the next world tag team champions, and that's a promise. Hart Foundation, all baby. Right, well, you I know, know, we've Jimmy. done it one time. I'm sure we can do it again, Jimmy. <laughs> all right, I thank you. Jimmy Hart of the Hart Foundation. There it is once again, the Hearts explaining that they were robbed, damn it. Jim the Anvil Nightheart says, it'd be like if Santa stole all the presents from under your Christmas tree. Strike Force stealing the title belts from the Hart Foundation as Bret Hart promises the Hearts indeed will rebound. And that they will. Fun times ahead for the Hart Foundation as we are off back to the rink. Brutus the Barber Beefcake couldn't keep a good man down, Greg Valentine. Beefer back taking on Barry Horowitz as right away we get an insert promo from Jimmy Hart and the Hammer. Valentine says he already hurt Beefcake the last go around, and next time he's going to finish the job. As the action gets going, Beefcake with some strutting and taunting early on, flustering Barry Horowitz, who can't really get anything going in this one, and it's the sleeper hold, putting Horowitz away in just one minute and 30 seconds. And Beefer a little kind to Barry here, who only gets a little cut off the back. And also the spray paint returns, Beefcake spray painting a big B on the chest of Horowitz which could easily stand for Barry, or Brutus, or Barber, or Beefcake. It's a little confusing. But post-match then, the Barber waking Barry Horowitz up to show Barry his reflection in the mirror. So they're busting this back out, Beefcake going back to the mirror. Haven't seen this in a few weeks. And Barry just freaks out, explodes in embarrassment, rushing out of the ring. Somehow he managed to see the back of his hair, I suppose. As we head off now, me, Gene Okerlund, standing by with the million dollar man all right during this uh, joyous holiday season i like to do some conduct some laid-back interviews if you will with some of the folks here in the world wrestling federation here's a gentleman i don't know a great deal about he really is quite closed mouth virgil come on in i like to like to have this guy around he's always 
Well, he's always got a fist full of dollars, so to speak, and a fairly fist full of my dollars. So, well, you've been quick to point that out, Ted DiBiase. <laughs> Those are your dollars. That's right, and the reason that he's got a firm grip on them is, well, look at the man. Look at the guns on this man. Do you think a man with my kind of money is going to hire somebody that's not capable of hanging on to my money and protecting it? Of course not. <laughs> yes, Virgil's a very good man. You know, a lot has been happening, and I must say, 1987, for you, Ted DiBiase, has been a very good year. You know, something, though, that just doesn't make sense to me. I have never, in all my years of covering this great sport of wrestling, have never seen anybody ascend to the top any quicker than you. And I bet it just hurts you to say that. This wouldn't have anything to do with it, would it? <laughs> hey, you know, you said that it's been a very good year for me. When you've got my kind of money, Oakland, every year is a good year. Every minute is a good minute. Every hour. You see, I've been saying it all along. Money talks louder than anything. And everybody's got a price. I have come to the World Wrestling Federation, and yes, in record time, and climbed that ladder. And in and out of the ring, Oakland, that's right, every opponent that has faced me has gone down to defeat every one of them in record time. And I said that I would buy the World Wrestling Federation heavyweight title. Have you seen, have you seen Hogan's face lately? Have you seen the pressure on this man's face? I've got it's confidence in him. Confidence in him. I mean, I have offered this man such an astronomical amount of money. I mean, he doesn't have to, you know, he's a wealthy man anyway. He sure is. Well, I've offered him more than he's worth. And for all you penny-polishing peons out there, it would make your head swim if I were to elaborate on the figure, but that's not the point. Only a very large fool would, I'm not even a fool, would say no to this offer. You said it's been a good year? No <laughs> gas pipe in the stock market? Hey, I caused the crash. We're right back. Ted DiBiase says he climbed the ladder in the WWF in record time. And now Hulk Hogan is feeling the pressure after the offer he made for the WWF title. Now, obviously, this is playing up the DiBiase still waiting for Hulk Hogan's answer over here on Wrestling Challenge. Because remember, in some markets, both shows air on Saturday and all sorts of days. Really, both shows could potentially air. So as of this promo, we're pretending right now that we don't know Hulk Hogan's answer. But DiBiase, he's going to have a response, I promise you, next week on TV. As off next, we see the Birdman, Coco Beware, hyping the Weekend Slammy Awards. And then it's back to the ring for tag team action, the Slicksters men. No, not the Bolsheviks, but they're coming. It's the one-man gang teaming with the natural Butch Reed, taking on the team of Special Delivery Jones and leaping Lanny Poffo as the heels enter the ring to jive soul bro. But no dancing yet from the future Akeem here. We do get an insert promo from The Rock, Don Morocco. And with Superstar Graham now out, Morocco basically replacing him in the feud with the Slickster's men. It's Lanny Poffo here with a poem admitting the heels put Superstar Graham out of business, but puts Graham over. And Lanny wisely does not bury his opponents this week. Good call. However, I don't know that it's going to make very much of a difference. As early on, leaping Lanny, he can't match strength with the natural. So he sneaks in a quick backslide, getting himself a two count before tagging out to special delivery. As the faces, they get a few shots in here on the one-man gang, but SD runs into a big gang on the apron. Great spot there. SD Jones basically running into the gang who's just standing on the apron, like running into a brick wall. And down goes Jones as the heels take over. And finally, the gang landing that master blaster gourd buster for the finish here on Jones. The heels go over three minutes and 11 seconds. And Kind of odd. Gang started using that 747 splash after Kamala left, and now it's seemingly back to this. Gord Buster, at least for the time being, as we are off to another special interview here. On Wrestling Challenge, Craig DeGeorge standing by up on the platform with Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And it's a promo in the holiday spirit, guys, as DeGeorge wishes us all happy holidays. A little PC for the 1980s. And Duggan gives us a ho, ho, ho! Very clever there, Hack. Duggan tells us that Christmas is a time for family and talks about his love for making snowmen. Duggan says he knows that Santa is keeping an eye on him, so he's going to try and behave. Hacksaw hoping that Mr. Claus brings him a truck full of lumber. And then it's back to the ring. More tag team action and more of Slick's men back to back. How about that? It's the Bolsheviks this time. Nikolai Volkov, Boris Zukov taking on Mike Richards and Rick Hunter. And Slick back out for more tag team action as Big Nick tries to sing the national anthem 
And to everyone's surprise, including myself, as Volkov begins to sing, Rick Hunter and Mike Richards dropkick the Bolsheviks from behind. Gets a huge pop from the fans, but the Russians do regroup and manage to take over on the offense. Nikolai launching Richards with a double underhook suplex across the ring. Zukov in with a Dick Slater-esque Russian leg sweep. And then Volkov back for the finish. It's the Gorilla Press into the backbreaker, scoring the win over Richards in just one minute and 15 seconds. Exactly how I like my Bolshevik matches. Quick and over with. And then up next, it's time for the Ultimate Warrior. Warrior taking on Rex King here. And there it is, that familiar Ultimate Warrior theme music now in play as UW upgrades walking to the ring to a power walk. So he's not running to the ring yet, guys, but he's getting there. And Rex King, he's going to go on to become one half of the Southern Rockers with Steve Dahl, the future well done. Steve Dahl will be Stephen Dunn, and of course that makes Rex King Timothy Well. But a much more slender King here eats a warrior power slam, a wind-up clothesline, Popeye style, and the gorilla press drop gets the warrior the win, one minute and 13 seconds. As the action continues on here, it's intercontinental champion, the Honky Tonk Man. Jimmy Hart in his corner taking on Cowboy Scott Casey, and Honky opens the segment with a special presentation, introducing us all to his girlfriend, Peggy Sue. Yes, indeed, the Peggy Sue character making her syndicated TV debut here this week, just in time for the new year. And out she comes with Gorilla Monsoon questioning her wearing sunglasses, but not selling the fact that it is indeed the ladies champion, the sensational Sherry. So Peggy Sue now by the side of the honky tonk man out here is going to insert promo from honky talking all about the Slammy Awards, vowing to win best music video. And as the action gets going, the honky tonk man with a cheap shot on Casey nailing him in the gut, gives him the early advantage to the champion, but Scotty comes fighting back, but misses a big elbow drop, and Honky going to immediately capitalize with a shake, rattle, and roll neckbreaker. I see champion Honky Tonk Man picking up yet another win, two minutes and five seconds, so some interesting takeaways with Peggy Sue now becoming more than just a house show gimmick. Remember, she was filling in while Jimmy Hart was up in those above the ring in the shark cage, so maybe they were wanting a female to counteract Miss Elizabeth at ringside during that honky macho feud, but it's not like Elizabeth was ever going to get physical out there. And clearly Vince McMahon was using the ladies title on the house shows. We've seen a lot of Sherry title defenses. Most recently it started with rock and Robin, but not really doing a whole lot with Sherry on TV right now. So I guess this is a way to get their money's worth out of Sherry. I'm just thinking out loud here, guys, but Sherry playing double duty as the WWF ladies champion. And here is pretty, 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 pretty Peggy Sue. Uh oh, Peggy. My Peggy Sue. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Sorry, guys. And I apologize even more to Buddy Holly. As we close out wrestling challenge in preparation for the Slammy Awards, guys, we've got one more soundbite queued up. Mean Gene Oakland standing by with Greg the Hammer Valentine. All right, as we take a look at some of the great events that have happened here in the World Wrestling Federation during the calendar year of 1987, as we kind of pack up shop here for the World Wrestling Federation. Come on in, Greg the Hammer Valentine. Some enormous changes have taken place most recently. You're announcing that you've got a new manager. You're under new management, as they say, with the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. And I must admit, Jimmy Hart has done very, very well for his men in the past. Well, you know what I mean, Gene? I've had some great years in the past in the World Wrestling Federation, 1984, 1985, 1986. But 1987 was filled with a lot of disappointments except for one, excluding one, and that's signing a big contract with Jimmy Hart. All right. I guess the big question right now, where does Greg the Hammer Valentine go from here in 1988? Well, it's right back up the top of that letter. You know, I haven't got somebody hanging on my on my apron strings now, Mean Gene. I've got Beefcake right where I want him. You know, the man, when we were the world tag team champions, the champions of the world, the man always depended on me. Now he's got to depend on himself. But he's also got himself in a lot of hot water. And, you know, I can't understand why the fans want to cheer for somebody like Brutus the Barber Beefcake. I call him Fruitcake. 
And all the fans, a long time ago, they used to call him Fruitcake too. But all of a sudden, he starts coming out the same side of the arena that Hulk Hogan and some of the other goody two-shoe boys do. All of a sudden, they think he's a great person, that he's got a good heart, and that he's a great wrestler. Well, first of all, I taught him everything there is to know about professional wrestling. And he is a pretty good wrestler. But he's not as good as I am. He lacks that killer instinct, Mean Gene. And I'll tell you one thing else, he is a lousy barber. He is the worst barber I've ever seen. And for the fans to cheer about some of the things that he has done in the ring, humiliating people, shaving their heads, making them look absolutely ridiculous, I'll tell you what, they should be cheering for me. But I, you know something, Mean Gene, I don't care. I'm going to take care of Fruitcake sooner or later. He's going to be nothing but a stepping stone. Lousy barber? Hey, Greg Valentine, he does my hair. Well, speaks for itself. <laughs> so Valentine admitting he had a very disappointing 1987. Besides re-signing with Jimmy Hart as his new manager, the Hammer, he's not a fan of his former partner, British Beefcake. That seems obvious at this point. So the feud will continue. Solid promos here from the Hammer. Better than having Johnny V out there to do his Tony Clifton shtick. That's for sure. So... Greg Valentine seems to have a resurgence of energy here. And this new singles push, we'll have to see how long that lasts. But now it's time, guys. I promised it. Here it is. It's the WWF's 37th Annual Slammy Awards. From Atlantic City, the entertainment capital of the universe. It's not the Oscars. It's not the Emmys. It's not the Tonys. It's not the Grammy. Hey, aren't we getting kind of close? Oh my God, I think we're gonna... It's the 37th Annual Slammy Award. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Vince McMahon. Thank you. All right, now this was taped a few days prior to December 16th. Atlantic City, New Jersey, Caesars Palace, but aired here on December 19th in syndication. Now, I've seen it state that it drew a 6.2 in the ratings. I'm not really sure what to make of that. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to break down what happened on the show. We're not going to spend a long period of time talking about this. Not a lot of sound bites or anything like that for the Slammy Awards, but just wanted to run through it because we do cover every base here in 1987. We're not going to leave no stone unturned. And it all starts off with the winners of the categories, the presentations out here, the Slammy Awards being given out. And here are some of the winners. Best performance by an animal presented by Mean Gene Oakland here. Of course, the animals up for the running. Uh, Matilda, the bulldog, Damien, the snake, Frankie, the macaw, and George, the animal, steal. And wouldn't you believe it? The animal, George Steele, winning the award for best performance by an animal. From there, we go to woman of the year presented by the honky tonk man and Jimmy Hart. That list includes a fake Dolly Parton, a fake Yoko Ono out there in the crowd, the fabulous Mula, of course, the ladies' champion, Sensational Sherry, but the winner, the Slammy, goes to the lovely Miss Elizabeth, and wouldn't you know it, the Honky Tonk Man and Jimmy Hart presenting the award, so the Macho Man taking care of the lovely Liz there as she wins a Slammy. How about that? From there, we go on Best Ring Apparel, presented by Hacksaw Jim Duggan who ironically, or maybe not so ironically, is just wearing a tuxedo t-shirt. Love it, hack. Always wanted one of those growing up. Never had one. So best ring apparel, and on the list, it's the British Bulldogs. Odd choice. The Honky Tonk Man. Makes sense. The Macho Man. Always makes sense. And Demolition. But the winner beats all of these out. Who could it be? The winner? Well, there's a good reason for it. Best apparel? The King Harley Race. Duggan doesn't want to announce the winner. So he has one of the lovely ladies up on the stage do so for him. And then Harley Race up there having an issue with Duggan. And the fight is on. What fight am I talking about? Go check it out, guys. It lasts off and on throughout the entire Slammy Awards here tonight. We'll see all kinds of comedy sketch fighting scenes backstage. Donkeys, llamas. Yes, I said llamas. All sorts of things in the way. Harley Race going through a table. There's food. There's makeup, powder. You name it, they break it. All kinds of nonsense going on in the back. Boxes, crates chain link fences. It's as wild and fun as you might imagine with Grilla Monsoon doing some comedy commentary over it. Bobby Heenan taking some fun bumps as well. And that fight's going to go on off and on. We're going to see clips of that throughout the remainder of the night. 
as we're meant to believe that the action continued nonstop for maybe over an hour, not really sure, but it concludes with the two men busting through a big video screen up there on the stage later in the show. Hillbilly Jim tossing Doug in a two by four from down in the crowd, Doug and chasing the king off of the stage area. So that feud absolutely continues on. Fun stuff there from Hacksaw and Harley Race. And could you imagine back in the day, the NWA world champion doing these things? But I got to tell you, for what it was and where we're at in Harley's career, he was a trooper and it was a lot of fun. Not going to lie. From there, Hulk Hogan presenting his Real American Award to the superstar Billy Graham. Of course, Hulk, the story goes, became a wrestler looking up to Graham, as did many, wanting to steal aspects of his character, which Hogan did, and many others as well. Jesse Ventura, Scott Steiner, Austin Idol. I mean, the list goes on, and Hulk Hogan presenting the Real American Award here to the superstar. And from there, we go to the Jesse the Body Award, of course, presented by Jesse the Body Ventura. And up for the running, well, Sensational Sherry, not going to argue that one. Also, the Mighty Hercules, the Natural Butch Reed, the Ultimate Warrior, and Ravishing Rick Rude, who will take home the trophy, the winner of the Jesse the Body Award, is indeed Ravishing Rick Rude. And Jesse's going to make that very clear for the next year or two. As the show goes on, Greatest Hit, presented by Jesse Ventura and Mean Gene Okerlund, Strike Force winning the tag team titles from the Hart Foundation, Bam Bam Bigelow's explosive burst onto the scene here in the WWF, Honky Talk Man bashing the guitar over the head of the Macho Man, Andre the Giant, anything he does can be considered a greatest hit, and of course the winner here is Hacksaw Jim Duggan for his use of the 2x4 over one King Harley Race. Uh, manager of the year. Well, Bobby Heenan says he was up for the running. He was going to win manager of the year. I wasn't sure if they had one. I couldn't remember, but here it is. Manager of the year. And up for the running, it's the Doctor of Style Slick, Jimmy Hart, Mr. Fuji, and Bobby the Brain Heenan. What? No Oliver Humperdinck? Well, that's so they can get over this shtick here as Gorilla Monsoon announces that, that there is no winner for manager of the year because all the managers up for the running were equally bad. From there, the Slammies go on. Best Personal Hygiene, presented by Ventura and Okerlund. No doubt a comedy award, thought up by one Vincent Kennedy McMahon. And here for Best Personal Hygiene, we saw the likes of George the Animal Steel, Hillbilly Jim, Sika the Wild Samoan, King Kong Bundy on a Toilet, I shit you not, pun intended, but the winners were the Bolsheviks, who were shown sharing a toothbrush. Ugh. So best personal hygiene goes to the Bolsheviks. Best vocal performance presented by the macho man Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth. And by vocal performance, they don't mean singing. It's actually just noises that people make. Jimmy Hart squealing, George Steele, hey, mine. The one-man gang's bellow, the junkyard dog's growl. But it's Hacksaw Jim Duggan winning yet another award. He should have been the two-time Slammy Award winning Hacksaw Jim Duggan. For his ho in the vocal performance. Don't remember him saying that in a song, but whatever. And then there were actually a few that didn't make air on the show that took place during the Slammy Awards. Uh, best group went to the one man gang. Get it? Best group, one man gang. Ha ha. Humanitarian of the Year Award went to the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Interesting. Probably bought it for himself. And then best head. Co-winners, Bam Bam Bigelow and Mean Gene Oakland. I think Bam Bam got the shaft there, but Mean Gene probably insisted that he win a Slammy. And that award was actually announced during one of the Harley Race Hacksaw Jim Duggan battles backstage by Gorilla Monsoon. We didn't see it, but he did announce it on the TV program. And then we close out the night. Song of the Year, presented by Jesse Ventura and Mean Gene. Was it Jimmy Hart's Crank It Up? The Honky Tonk Man's Honky Tonk Man. The Birdman, singing Pile Driver. Vince McMahon's Stand Back. Could it be all of the performers, if you only knew? And as Jesse and Mean Gene go to reveal the winner, the heels take the card with the winner's name on it and begin passing it around. Several of them, mind you, are looking right at the winner before it finally finds itself in the hands or the mouth of Sika, who eats the winner, or at least eats the paper with the announcement of the winner. All of that to set up yet another potty joke as Jesse Ventura explains 
if we want another winner, we'll have to wait till tomorrow morning, basically implying when Sika shits it out. Now, I didn't think about it at the time, but obviously at least 10 people, maybe more, saw the winner on that paper, but nobody's talking. So I guess we'll never know. Song of the Year. And of course, throughout the night, I should mention lots of wrestlers performed their, their songs from the Pile Driver album, Jimmy Hart taking the place of Robbie Dupree singing Girls in Cars, Vince McMahon doing an awesome rendition of Stand Back. And there's a part in this song where Vince, he goes into Attitude Era Vince mode, sounds identical to what he would sound like when he was yelling at Stone Cold Steve Austin. And I have to mark out for it when you go back and listen. Stand back! Go, Vince McMahon. Coco Beware singing the Pile Driver album. Several wrestlers made fools of by going up there and pretending to play instruments throughout the night. The Macho Man on trumpet, Jake Roberts, Brutus Beefcake, Killer Bees, JYD. I think it was Bam Bam Bigelow on a saxophone. Of course, Hogan playing the bass guitar, brother. Just a fun night. A night for everybody to unwind heading into the holidays. I think the WWF, the, if I remember correctly, we were covering the house shows. It was around the 16th when they filmed this at that they closed up shop and everybody was off until after Christmas. So this was just like a fun night to sit back and unwind and have a little fun. I'm sure there wasn't a lot of uh, relaxation for some of these guys, like the Honky Tonk Man, who had to go up there and really perform, including the Heart Foundation coming out and dancing with one another during that honky theme, Je- Jesse Lee Ventura on the piano. Just a fun night all around. I encourage everybody, I believe it's still on the Peacock, on the WWE Network, to go check it out. The first time I saw this, no, I didn't see it when it aired live, but I did have it taped, master copy. It was gifted to me just a couple of years later after that, and when I saw it, you want to talk about breaking kayfabe, or, well, speaking of kayfabe, if you watch the credits at the end of the show, I don't remember if it's producer, director, or what have you, but the name on the credit roll is kayfabe. So a big slap in the face to the other wrestling companies out there is sports entertainment is what it's all about, pal. But just a fun night. If you want to take things a little less seriously for one night only, the, the Slammy Awards, just a great time beginning to end. And I like, I like watching the, uh, the song numbers. As we roll on to primetime wrestling now, the Slammy Awards behind us, sad to say, as we're off to primetime December 21st. Here we are, December 21st, hosted by Gorilla Monsoon, Bobby the Brain Heenan, as we head off now to the intro. Christmas week now upon us, and primetime also recorded from Caesars Palace in Atlantic City. I'm Gorilla Monsoon. And I'm your host, Bobby the Brain Heenan. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Primetime Wrestling, where we feature the superstars of the World Wrestling Federation. This week, coming to you direct from Caesars, here in Atlantic City, on the boardwalk, are you glad you're here? Oh, right. Caesars is my favorite place. Well, you had a good time when we were out in Vegas. I'm had sure you had a great time. Even better time right here. Broke Caesars. the bank there. Oh, yeah. What, the piggy bank? What is this? I'm looking down the, the rundown here for this week, and it's it's all brain family here. It's all family night. It's Christmas. It's all family I'm night. the brain. I you're can have whatever I got you. I'm the host. You under the tree. Is right it ticking? On. No, it's not ticking. Feature match this week. Current World Wrestling Federation tag team champions, Strike Force, taking on Heckle and Jekyll, better known as the Islanders, Haku and Tama. This is a title match, you know, Brian. What are you looking for? My phone. Your phone. I explicitly told him I had to have a phone. That's why it's not here. You didn't ask me. Oh, why do I'm I have the host. To, I'm the host. Oh, excuse me. I'll get to Let's it. Let's go to our first matchup Joel, right now. need a phone. As the Junkyard Dog takes on another member of the Heenan family, phone. Hercules. Let's go to ringside. Gorilla Pondering, what's with all of the Heenan family members in action this week? Bobby Heenan replies, that's simple. It's Christmas. What a present for us all. The Heenan family in multiple matches here this week on Primetime. Gorilla and Bobby joining us from Caesars Palace with a Christmas tree in the background. As the show continues to roll on, the brain going to tell us all about the brand new tag team, the Conquistadors. All right, brain, it's time for you to unload with some of that massive knowledge you have stored up inside that cranium of yours. Tell the folks out there something about the Conquistadors. 
They're masked men. I, I, something other than what's obvious. They're from parts unknown. They're not from parts unknown. I understand, them are. I understand they're from South America. That's right. Direct descendants of Cortez. That's right. They got a lot of gold. Yes, they do. Surprise you didn't try to grab them like you grab everybody you else. You grab. The way you make it sound like I'm a leech. Well, if the shoe fits, put it on. Right now, let's go to ring size. Conquistadors, try out the young stallions. <laughs> So Gorilla asking Bobby, what do you know about these conquistadors? Hina replies, they wear masks. It's the simple things that make me laugh. From there, Bobby stating that they're from parts unknown. No, no, Bobby. They're from somewhere in Latin America. Even better. As we go on, a special event upcoming Sunday, January 24th. We learn about it here. Going to be free on the USA Network. It's called the Royal Rumble. Well, folks, as we promised you earlier on, a special event coming up right here on the USA Network, the Royal Rumble, Sunday, January 24th. Featuring the king? No, it's not featuring the king. Well, it's the Royal Rumble. Well, that's just a name they gave to this event. It has nothing to do with the king. The well, king I may it was be like involved. A salute to the king. No, it well, should special. be. It's a special tribute to the fans of the World Wrestling Federation, and you folks right here on the USA Network are going to get to see it in the privacy of your own living rooms for absolutely nothing. It's got a free attraction put on by the World Wrestling Federation featuring all the stars of the World Wrestling Federation. It's all coming your way Sunday, January 24th, the Royal Rumble. You won't want to miss it. So a free special on the USA Network coming January 24th for the WWF fans. Free major attraction on USA. So take that, JCP, and the Bunkhouse Stampede. Vince McMahon not playing around. As we continue on, Craig DeGeorge standing by now for an interview with Brutus the Barber Beefcake. All right, we will return to Gorilla and the Brain in just a bit, but first of all, I want to get a little barber shop talk in with my guest, the barber, Brutus Beefcake, who is wrapping up a terrific 1987, many fine styles fashion, and I know you have some new things planned in the way of wrestling, in the way of cutting for 1988. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, barbering's not the only thing that I can do, but it does happen to be something that I enjoy very, very much. And one thing I would enjoy very much. You have any idea what that might be? Uh, I'm sure there are many things. What? I'd be kicking that big fat thigh's butt all over the state. Whatever state it might be. What state of mind am I in? Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Hammer. I got the sickle. Oh, boy. That's going to take care of the hammer. Now, this is cold steel, brother. This is cold steel. And you know what they call these? They call these the tools of the trade. Tools. The barber's tools. And a good barber knows how to use his tools and take advantage of them. 100% of the time. So there won't be no mistakes. We're going to be seeing hedge clippers in stylish shops? That's right. These babies are what's happening for the 90s, Greg the Hammer Valentine. I hope you're ready. I hope you know what's going to happen if you happen to get your little chubby fingers in here. And go, <laughs> or maybe your little slime ball manager, Jimmy yeah, Hart. Man. Maybe he gets his uh, hair caught in here and... Oh, baby. Jimmy Hart, I was going to mention him. He's gotten his act into your way before. <laughs> I'm ready for you guys. All right, well, I'm ready for change, you, man. And indeed, the I'm barber ready. will be changing with the times, I guess, the barber Brutus Beefcake. And Beefer ahead of his time already talking the styles of the 90s. This is 1987. Greg Valentine and Jimmy Hart, look out. And as we close out this edition of Primetime Wrestling, it's gift exchange time. Remember last year, Gorilla Monsoon trying to gift Bobby Heenan a beautiful Christmas present for the holidays. Bobby wouldn't accept it. He didn't trust the Gorilla only to find out it was a beautiful phone, a golden-type phone. Heenan wanted it, but a little too late. And here this year, Gorilla trying to exchange presents with the brain, but the brain pleading with Gorilla not to open the package here on TV. But Gorilla Monsoon opening that present early against Bobby's wishes, and it's, it's a box full of hotel goodies. Yes, little samples of soaps and shampoos, napkins, you name it, it's in there. Gorilla Monsoon then taking his gift back that he got from the brain. How dare you, Bobby? Primetime Wrestling going off the air. Merry Christmas, everyone. And what is that in the closing credits of Primetime? We saw Kay Fabe on the Slammy Awards, but here, yes, the producer, now Bruce Pritchard, 
seen that for a few weeks, maybe a couple months. But the director here of Primetime, heading into 1988, Joel Watts. Yes, the son of Cowboy Bill Watts. Joel Watts had a brief stint here after the Cowboys sold the UWF over to Jim Crockett earlier in 1987. Joel Watts comes aboard, who did a great production for his father in the UWF. So Joel was indeed with the WWF for a short period of time, and I wrote awesome seeing his name here in the credits. As we see exclusive matches also here this week on Primetime, and the following three matches recorded back on December 10th in Fort Myers, Florida, it's Hacksaw Jim Duggan pinning a different King, not Harley Race, but rather Rex King with the running clothesline two and a half minutes. Then from there, it is the King, Harley Race, Bobby Heenan in his corner, pinning Jim Evans in just a minute with the cradle suplex, no bridge. And also in the main event of primetime, it was the Islanders, again with Bobby in their corner, defeating the WWF Tag Team Champion Strike Force on a countout. Match went 11 minutes when both teams spilled to the outside, Tama able to beat the count back in, and the Islanders going to defeat the Tag Team Champions. But it is announced that Rick Martel and Tito Santana will retain the titles, because as if we don't know by now, the titles cannot change hands on a countout course upsetting the brain and his islanders who leave without anything though they do get the win for some reason rick martell sells it like they won the matchup in the ring holding the belt up high as we conclude this week's edition of primetime wrestling rolling on to the final week of 1987 it's superstars for december 26th take back december 9th tampa florida once again at the sun dome vince mcmahon jesse ventura and bruno all out here as we head to the ring for Bam Bam Bigelow with Oliver Humperdinck, it's Bam Bam taking on Van Van Horn. Bam Bam versus Van Van. And there it is, that big band brass music just works for Bam Bam Bigelow. I love it, watching him head to the ring with Oliver Humperdinck. Insert promo here from the one-man gang and Slick. The gang says, not impressed by Bam Bam Bigelow, who won that battle royal way back in October because everyone ganged up to toss out the gang first. It's the only reason Bam Bam won that battle royal, why we're referencing something from two months ago, I have no idea, but I did write, actually, gang, it was Junkyard Dog who single-handedly tossed you out right at the beginning of the match, but either way, gang now coming for Bigelow for what appears to be a now verified feud. And back to the action here, Bam Bam impressive as always, big clothesline, nice vertical suplex, press slam, picking up Van Horn over his head, tossing him down, standing drop kick, awesome as always and the slingshot splash over the top rope back into the ring, giving Bigelow the win, 2 minutes and 24 seconds, and monster crowd noise here for Bam Bam Bigelow heading in to 1988. As right now, last week, we heard the answer from the WWF champion Hulk Hogan. Hell no! Just a reminder. And now we're off to a special interview. Craig DeGeorge standing up on the platform ready to interview the million-dollar man Ted DiBiase. Virgil by his side. DiBiase going to respond to Hulk Hogan's answer. As Craig asking DiBiase here his thoughts on Hulk Hogan declining Ted's offer to buy the WWF title, DiBiase says he offered the 300-pound fool Hulk Hogan a stupendous amount of money that if he announced the amount here to the crowd, their heads would spin. DiBiase goes on to say one day Hulk will look back and realize just how stupid he was, but Ted then smiles and says there's more than one way to humble a Hulk. Hmm, wonder what he means by that. So obviously pissed off, Ted DiBiase shouts that he gets what he wants, and he wants that WWF title, and he will still buy that WWF championship. And you guys can take that to the bank. So this story will clearly continue into 1988, and I, for one, can't wait as we head back to the ring for the one-man gang slick in his corner taking on Tom Horn. And we heard Gang earlier talking to Bam Bam Bigelow during his match, and now it's Bammer's turn. Yes, insert promo here from Bam Bam Bigelow. He says he heard the Gang was running his mouth during his match earlier in the night. Well, Bigelow, he says he ain't too hard to find. So it sounds like Gang essentially issuing a challenge and Bam Bam Bigelow accepting here. The feud is on. And just a mauling here in the ring, the gang all over Tom Horn ends it with the Gourd Buster once more. And it was so nasty, so dangerous here this week, the Gourd Buster almost becomes a reverse Brain Buster. I wrote, yikes, very dangerous drop. But things went over smooth, and the gang going to score the win, 1 minute and 47 seconds, as we're off now to Mean Gene Oakland, standing by with the tag team champions, Strike Force. All right, I want to 
to take the opportunity of wishing everybody, you and yours, for the World Wrestling Federation, a happy, healthy, and prosperous 1988. I know it's going to be a, a great year. We're looking for bigger, better things from the World Wrestling Federation. Something that is a red-hot topic as we close out 1987. Come on in. New tag team champions Rick Martel, Tito yeah, Santana. Your title defenses for 1988 and some of the great teams you're going to have to be facing as potential challengers. Obviously, the Hart Foundation, one of those teams. You can't forget about the Islanders, nor a lot of other great teams here in the World Wrestling Federation, Tito. That's exactly right, Mean Gene. You know, and this is the first time that the World Tech Team belts have gone overseas also. We will be defending the belts in Japan, Australia, Germany, Hart Foundation. You never took any of those contracts. You know, uh, they're making comments that uh, we're trying to hide. We don't hide from nobody, Hart Foundation. The WWF has the toughest opponents. All of a sudden, the World Tech Team belts are very important. There's a lot of combinations. The Hart Foundation, the Islanders want another shot at us. The demolition. Demolition, The awesome. Bolsheviks, and you can just keep on talking about the opposition. We knew what it took to beat the Hart Foundation, and we know what it's going to take to hold on to it, and I guarantee you we're going to go by the book. All right, on a lighter note, Rick Martell, I understand through the grapevine, my sources, that uh, over Christmas, the Hart Foundation received special Christmas gifts. We don't know from whom, but uh, a couple of crying towels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, you know, they're going to need them. You know, yes, they are whiners, they are crybabies, but, you know, the fact remained that the Broken Heart Foundation, they were tag team champions for a long time. You know, they have a lot of dirty tricks up their sleeve. You know, and that Jim Knight Hart is a big and powerful man. And that Bret Hart is very quick and a very good wrestling technician, you know. So you combine that with that Jimmy Hart as their manager. Yes, they are a big threat to a strike force in the tag team championship. But you know, the people were behind us from day one when Tito and I formed the strike force. And they helped us take those belts. And they know we are fighting champions and we're not going to quit. We're going to hang on to those titles, right? To All right, there are millions that love you around the world. If you'd, Arriba, baby, yeah. if you'd like to say Happy New Year, you have that opportunity. Strike Force, Tag Team Champions of the World. So lots of challengers in line here for the champs, including the former champion Heart Foundation, Haku and Tama. We just saw them score a win over the champions on a countout. And of course, Demolition. And as we head into a commercial break, a reminder, a special reminder here, the feature matchup. This week on Superstars, the British Bulldogs scheduled to take on Haku and Tama, the Islanders. Yes, it's that match, guys, so stay tuned for that. But for now, it's back to the ring for Brutus the Barber Beefcake, taking on Rick Gantner. As we get an insert promo from Greg Valentine here, he says he knows that Fruitcake hasn't recovered from that figure four that he laid on him last time. And next time, scissors or not, Valentine gonna finish the job. And as the action gets going, Barber has his way with the future bull pain. And the sleeper hold going to score the win over Gantner, just 2 minutes and 15 seconds. And of course, we get a little post-match fun, some spray paint to the chest, and a haircut for the red-headed Gantner. And I wrote here in my notes, man, are the baby faces over right now. The crowd responds for Macho Man, Bigelow, Beefcake, Duggan, Jake, all of them. The crowd response is just insane. And Warrior catching up real fast. And speaking of one of those names right now, we head off to Craig DeGeorge. He's standing by with the macho man, Randy Savage. Well, when you talk about major superstars here at the World Wrestling Federation, indeed, my next guest, well, his name rolls off your lips right away when you put the names in that category. And also in 1987, really a year that leaves him, I think, with a couple of goals yeah. with the superstar, Mr. Macho Man Randy Savage. What about now those goals for 1988? The way you make me feel. Oh, yeah. The way you turn me on, and I'm talking to the Macho Madness fans, yeah. yeah. When Elizabeth leads the Macho Man Randy Savage down that aisle, yeah. And I'm talking about the momentum in 1988. And to the people that don't like the Macho Man Randy Savage, I say unchain my heart, yeah. Unchain my heart! Because Honky Tonk Man, I've got you in proper perspective, yeah. Got the video scope right on you, man, yeah. Right into the danger zone, 1987, you humiliated Elizabeth right there on Saturday night's main event. But on the same night, by humiliating Elizabeth, you humiliated the macho man Randy Savage. 87 was your year, but 1988 is macho madness, yeah, macho madness, one half of the mega powers, talking to you, 
I'm gonna humiliate you, yeah. Not only take the Intercontinental Heavyweight Championship belt, but I'm gonna humiliate you, yeah. Expect the unexpected. In fact, Tonky Tonk Man, uh huh. I'm thinking, thinking, thinking that you should wear about 375 <clears throat> pairs of tights when you wrestle the Macho Man Randy Savage. Why? Because not only am I gonna take the title, but the humiliation factor, yeah. I'm gonna strip you naked right there in front of all the people, zillions and zillions of people all around the world, yeah. And I'm thinking, thinking, thinking that this is the time, this is the time to put you at the end of the road, yeah. A dead end street, you and your momentum. Stop right here, yeah. Stop right here in front of the macho man Randy Savage. Honky talk, man. I'm gonna get you, man. Ooh, yeah. Macho I'm man, gonna Randy get you, Savage, yeah. You are ready, you are set. Revenge. Yeah. Revenge might be the word for this man. Randy, Macho Man Savage, thank you very gonna much. Get you. So the new year, 1988, sees the macho man with momentum heading in, but it's also unfinished business with the honky talk man who is currently smack dab in the middle of the danger zone. Aha! Savage promising to strip Honky of the title and maybe strip him of his tights as well. As we go off now, fans reacting to Hulk's decision not to sell that WWF title to the Million Dollar Man, and it's seemingly 100% all behind the Hulkster. I think they selected which videos they wanted to play here. Jesse Ventura is not buying that everyone agrees with Hulk Hogan's decision. Me too, Jess. Me too. It's back to the ring now for IC champion Honky Tonk Man Jimmy Hart in his corner taking on Brady Boone. And she debuted last week on Wrestling Challenge. And just in time for the holidays, here we get the superstars debut of Peggy Sue. As the bell sounds and it takes Honky another 40 seconds after the bell just to remove his jumpsuit to begin the action. And Brady Boone on the offense early does a backflip off the top rope, landing on his feet for no reason. Boone then rushing into the corner but missing a drop kick and Honky Tonk capitalizing with the shake, rattle, and roll neckbreaker. Honky Tonk Man using one move here this week. That's all he needed, scoring the win in one minute and 34 seconds. So essentially, less than a minute of action here after Honky got his gear off, and Honky landing one move, his finisher. But you really didn't need much more than that for the Honky Tonk Man character. As we're off to update, and Craig DeGeorge, he recaps the Slammy Awards, particularly the almost show-long brawl between the King Harley race and Hacksaw Jim Duggan, so those two continuing to feud into 1988. And then it's back to the ring. Feature match time. It's promised, guys. Here it is. The British Bulldogs, Davy Boy Smith and Dynamite Kid, along with their mascot, Matilda, taking on Haku and Tama, the Islanders, with Bobby Heenan by their side. And the heels are indeed out first, followed by the Bulldogs and Matilda. And Matilda hits the ring and goes charging after the Islanders, and more specifically, Bobby Heenan, and Bobby's neck, it must have been feeling a little better here this week. Neck brace or not, because he goes flying over the top rope, not once, but twice, to escape the jaws of Matilda, the mascot not messing around. And Bobby Heenan finally has enough of these bulldog shenanigans, grabbing the house mic, the brain demanding that Matilda be removed from ringside, or there will be no match. And when that demand is not enforced, Bobby takes his Islanders, and the boys go walking up the aisle all the way back to the entrance curtains where they stop and they huddle. Then the Heenan family members break said huddle and march back to ringside. Uh Uh-oh, I don't like this. They don't call him the brain for nothing. So back to ringside, the Islanders and Bobby Heenan goes, Bobby instructing Haku and Tama to walk around opposite sides of the ring while Bobby jumping up on the apron to distract the referee and more importantly distract the British Bulldogs. And as you might suspect, the Islanders jumping the Bulldogs from behind and just put a beating on them, pounding them down, headbutts, backdrops, shoulder breakers, Davy Boy and Dynamite getting flung out to the floor, down go both Bulldogs. Meanwhile, the Islanders hop out of the ring on the opposite side and kidnap Matilda. That's dog napping, caught on video. Naturally, Haku gets chosen to be the one who grabs the mascot first. Wise move, choosing Haku. As Tama joins in and the two men run off together, holding Matilda in their arms, Bobby Heenan running right behind them. Hey, where are they going? The camera's following the Islanders all the way to the back, where they run all the way down the hallway. Clearly a plan in mind here. I don't like the looks of this as we see the Bulldogs begin chase, coming after their mascot. They head backstage, 
both of them slipping on something coming through the curtains. I wrote LOL. Clearly not planned, but the chase is on as we head into a commercial break. Poor Matilda. Oh, and by the way, for those curious, match never started, so no contest, I suppose. As we come back from break, we're promised more on the ongoing chase between the Islanders and the Bulldogs, but for right now, it's back to the ring for more action involving Ravishing Rick Rude as he's taking on Jerry Allen. And of course, no Bobby Heenan ringside here, still running from the Bulldogs somewhere. So the winner of the Jesse the Body Award here, Rick Rude, wants us to keep the noise down so he can flex for the ladies. But as Rude poses, Jerry Allen drop kick from behind. Wow. Sends Rude into the corner buckle and the crowd popping huge for Jerry Allen as Rick Rude bails out of the ring to regroup. Then Rude back inside, though, quick to take control and lock in the body breaker. Don't want to piss off ravishing Rick Rude, guys, scoring the submission win in just 48 seconds. And Rick now beginning that hands behind the head pose. No hip swivel yet, though. But an impressive win there from Rick Rude as the action just continues on with the ultimate warrior taking on Rick Rinslow here this week. Warrior getting a loud roar for his entrance. Even Vince McMahon remarks, wow. Vince seeing dollar signs in this warrior character as back-to-back matches, Rude and Warrior, and both matches featuring commentary basically pitting their bodies against each other. Jesse arguing that Rick Rude won best body because his abs are more chiseled and he has a better looking face. Jesse also says that the warrior cheats for his physique. Insert your jokes there. No, the body says that warrior cheats because he uses tassels tied around his arms to make his veins pop out. And as the match gets going here, warrior busting out a vertical suplex, believe it or not, before the gorilla press drop. Going to score the warrior yet another win here on TV. One minute and 43 seconds. And now we're off to Craig DeGeorge, standing by with the Hart Foundation. All right, as we wrap up 1987 here in the World Wrestling Federation, look now at one of the tag teams that certainly was the story, I think, of the tag team division for most of the year, that is, most of the year. We'll talk with the Hart Foundation in just a bit, also the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. Come on in now, Jimmy. Your Hart Foundation won the belt earlier in the year, of course, against the British Bulldogs, held it for most of the year, and certainly that is a major accomplishment, but then some bad news for your team. Yeah, you better believe it was bad. We were ripped off and we were robbed. I'm not going to sit here and whine and complain and make excuses, but I'm just going to tell it like it is, man. There's something fishy going on against the Hart Foundation. There's jealousy. Right, Anvil? Right, Hitman? Jealousy. In the Anvil Night Hart Foundation. And Brett the Hitman Hart, I wonder. something. Shut up! Nobody cares if you wonder anything or not! That's it. Ooh. There's a lot of prisons out there. And a lot of jails, a lot of bad men in those prisons and jails, and you children would never, ever want to spend a night in one of those. That's right. But you know something? Strike Force, what they did for the thievery and the robbery and the lying that went on in the way they took the belts from us, they belong in prison. The worst prison that they could ever find to put them in. And I promised Jimmy Hart and I promised Brett that I wouldn't get excited, and I wouldn't get carried away and lose my emotion, and I might think I think someone like you. Watch your blood pressure. Watch your blood pressure. But I'm just I'm just gonna keep calm. I know, I know that we've made a Okay. You see? We made a prediction. <laughs> I get it. We made a prediction in 1987. That we take the uh, World Championship tag team belts from the Bulldogs. And uh, what happened? You bet. You did. You're right. Okay. Our prediction came true. So now I'm predicting it again for 1988, and it's going to come true. Strike Force. Let me tell you something. A lot of teams win the belt. Actually, very few win the belts. But a lot of them, after they lose the belts, they lose that will to live or something, and they just dry up and blow away. That is not the case. The Hart Foundation. We are as bad as we ever were. We're going to prove it in 1988 because we are going to win back the belts that are rightfully ours because we are the best in the world. Oh, and they are the Hot Foundation yeah. planning big things yeah. for 1988. So they continue to reiterate the Anvil would never submit to a measly Boston Crab. The Hart Foundation were robbed of those tag team titles. They want their rematch. They want to regain what they feel they never should have lost. So it feels like we're going to go back into some Strike Force title matches here in the early part of 88, at least on the house shows. We'll have to wait and see how that plays out. But right now, closing out Wrestling Challenge, we go backstage. Hey, what happened to Matilda? Craig to George standing by near the exit door to keep us abreast of the situation. And right now he says he has no idea where the Islanders and Bobby Heenan have taken the Bulldog. 
as the British Bulldogs looking everywhere for her right now. But that's all we know for this week, so we'll have to wait for the new year to find out where is Matilda. So unfortunately, for those waiting, we have no update on Matilda as we ring in the new year of 1988. But we do learn that next week here on Superstars, it's the 1987 Year in Review show. Should be quick. Also next week, it's the next edition of Saturday Night's Main Event, the rematch between King Kong Bundy and WWF Champion Hulk Hogan, and so much more. So stay tuned for that on the next episode of The Grenade. And you might think this being the winner and being this far out from WrestleMania that the WWF, they would go easy on their feuds. But they may have more going now than they've ever had going at any one time. Now, we can see Hulk Hogan versus Ted DiBiase brewing. We know we have Hulk and Andre as well. Macho Man versus the Honky Tonk Man still going on. But how about all of the other feuds right now? Talking about Don Morocco versus Butch Reed, Hacksaw and Harley Race, Valentine and Beefcake, Demolition. They've been feuding with Patera and Haynes, as we'll continue to see here. Also, the Islanders now against the British Bulldogs, it would appear. One man gang challenging Bam Bam Bigelow. Both men trash talking each other. Seems like the Hart Foundation's still coming for Strike Force. I mean, even Danny Davis and Sam Houston have a feud. And it kind of feels, at least this week, like they were trying to tease a Rick Root Ultimate Warrior feud here. Now, that's not really going to come to fruition for another year, but they planted some seeds here early on. But yeah, it's like you're talking seven, eight, nine feuds right now here in the WWF. Lots of things going on, really going to bolster the Winter House Show gates. We'll have to see how that plays out heading into the new year. But for right now, we head off to. The final wrestling challenge of 1987, December 27th, taped back December 10th, Fort Myers, Florida at the Lee Civic Center. Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon on commentary as we see the tag team champion Strike Force head out to take on Terry Gibbs and Rick Gantner. Is he going to insert promo one more time? Jeez, beat it to death, guys. Hart Foundation and Jimmy Hart, they want their belts back as the champions dominate on the offense most of the way until Rick Martell finds himself in the heel corner. But the future model does manage a knee lift on Gantner to allow Martell to hot tag out to Tito Santana. And Tito comes in running wild, Santana mopping up his foes before tagging back to Rick. Martell with a power slam and a Boston Crab on Gantner, giving Strikeforce the submission win, three minutes and six seconds. And I'll say this for Strikeforce, two perfectly solid talents that should be insanely over as a tag team here on paper. But the goody-goody deal? Just isn't working with the fans. Strike Force are getting cheers, but just not to the level of all the other names that we talked about already here this week. As those Islander attacks on Tito and Rick Martell individually back at the end of the summer, they feel just so long ago. It's time for Strike Force to get a good program going, or I fear their title run may be over very soon. As up next, it's Special Report with Craig DeGeorge. He highlights Hulk Hogan refusing Ted DiBiase's offer to buy the WWF title. And then post segment, Bobby Heenan on commentary, even though he was complaining in recent weeks about DiBiase trying to buy the belt, the brain refers to Hulk Hogan as an idiot for declining DiBiase's offer. And speaking of the million dollar man, we head back to the ring to see Ted DiBiase in action. Virgil by his side, taking on C.V. Afi. Is he going to insert promo from a more subdued DiBiase here on Wrestling Challenge, a little more angry on superstars? DiBiase laughing at the thought of people thinking that he's upset for Hulk Hogan turning down the offer to buy the WWF title because Ted not even sweating it, stating he always gets what he wants and he will have that WWF title one way or another. And you got to love the cockiness of the Million Dollar Man character and it's back to the action. And I don't know who keeps booking this matchup, DiBiase versus Siviafi, but here we go again. I feel like this is at least the third time we've seen this in so many months. Pretty basic stuff here as the heel DiBiase right now relying on aggression and relentless beatdowns rather than actual wrestling clinic matches. And the falling back elbow going to give DiBiase the win one more time, 2 minutes and 17 seconds. Then it's off to a soundbite queued up here of Craig DeGeorge standing by. He's got an interview lined up with ravishing Rick Rude. All right, happy holidays and indeed happy new year to you and yours from all of us here at the World Wrestling Federation. And as we look ahead to 1988, I want to reflect back on a moment. On 1987, and what a good year it's been for my... Upcoming guest, Ravishing Rick Root, I will pay you that much. You came along in the World Wrestling Federation. You beat a lot of people. You showed them perhaps what a physique is all about. I will hand you that, Ravishing Rick Root. As you look ahead to 1988, I wonder 
uh, what you have in store now. Well, you will hand me that. Well, thank you very much. I, that, that means just so much to me what you think. I'm glad I flattered you. Oh, you flattered me. You know, 1987 was a super year for Ravishing Rick Rude. And it's the holiday season, and I'm in kind of a peppy mood myself. So I'd like to wish all the people out there a happy new year, but I know it isn't going to be anywhere near the new year that I'm going to have because I'm the sexiest man alive, and you're just probably a fat beer belly construction worker. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're talking but about. But things are just going to keep rolling along for me like a snowball downhill, getting bigger and picking up momentum as I go. 1988 is my year to take down the big blonde... Hulk oh, Hogan. man, you're going after Hulk Hogan. Oh, what, what, would you, what would you think? What do you think I'm doing here? What do you think I'm doing here? If I ain't going after Hulk Hogan, I'm going after somebody's old lady. But right now, oh. my mind is on Hulk Hogan in the WWF. I, I've been waiting title. for a while for a member of the Bobby Heenan family. We've been hearing it for a long time, the manager of champions and so on, and, and we don't see a champion in the stable. You might not be seeing much at all if I swole your eyes shut, little man. Why don't you just shut up and let me do the talking? As a matter of fact, Bobby Heenan's family, it's not a stable. That's where you keep horses and cows and such. Bobby Heenan's family is all champions. Whether we wear a belt or not, we're all champions. I'm the sexiest man alive, and you can't deny it. All you have to do is go home and ask that sea hag old lady of yours. Oh, She'll man. tell you. The fact of the matter is... Ravishing Rick Rude is going to take the world title from Hulk Hogan in 1988. And that means whoever stands in my way between now and Hulk Hogan is going down with a thud, little All man. Right, I think we got some major words there from Ravishing Rick Rude. Let's see if we can hold him to it. So Rick Rude, he had a super 1987, but the sky's the limit. In 1988, Rick Rude has his eyes on two things, the WWF title and someone's old lady. True. And I always love that line. It's a family, not a stable. A stable is where you keep your horses. And the Rick Rude character, just a natural fit here. Being held down in JCP, just a natural fit here in the sports entertainment world of the WWF. And don't get me wrong, Rude would fit in anywhere with his style in the ring as well. But he was ready when he arrived here. He was given an opportunity and he took it. As we head back to the ring, more action now. Jake the Snake Roberts taking on Steve Lombardi as Jake frustrates Lombardi early on, leading to him rolling out of the ring to regroup. And then once back inside, Lombardi lands a few shots, but Jake puts an end to that with his pendant knee lift. Steve going to try another comeback later on, but runs into Damien's bag in the corner and becomes distracted by it, allowing Roberts to land a back suplex. From there, the yet-to-be-named Brooklyn Brawler going to go to the eyes, hoping to escape Jake's grasp but soon learns there is no escape from the DDT. Jake Roberts picking up the win, 2 minutes and 15 seconds, and Jake, he may be the only big established name here in the company without a feud right now. That'll eventually change, but I get it. He's fresh off his injury, fresh off suspension. Time to get back into the full swing of things here as we head into the new year for the Snake Man. As up next, we have another interview lined up. Craig DeGeorge standing by with Oliver Humperdink and his man, Bam Bam Bigelow. Well, you talk about signing a blue chipper. Headline news. We heard about Bam Bam Bigelow probably for two months before we first saw Bam Bam Bigelow. And indeed, it was a major inking for one Oliver Humperdinck. Come on in, gentlemen. Bam Bam Bigelow, Oliver Humperdinck. 1987 has been a big year for you. I know you like to reflect back, but you really also have to look ahead now to 1988. That's exactly right. I want to wish everybody out there a very happy holiday season and a very happy new year because it's going to be a happy new year for us. 87 was great. Thank you for that. 88 is going to be even better. You can yeah. thank us for that because we're going to rid the World Wrestling Federation of a lot of troublemakers. And I'm talking about guys like King Kong well. Bundy and especially the one-man gang because, gang, you've been on a reign of terror around here for too long. And if I have anything to say about it, and you know I will. Yes, you will. One-man gang, this is going to be the last time around for you, pal. And that little sleazy manager of yours, Slick, well, there's not much I can say out here because they'll be playing organ music next week in this time slot. But Slick, you better mind your business because whenever we meet, I'm talking about the one-man gang and Bam Bam Bigelow. If you're around and I'm around, sparks are going to fly, pal. Well, I think one thing, Oliver Humperdinck, fans, no matter what their feelings are for the one-man gang, they have to respect his size, his strength, his ability. And I think they would also like to see that very matchup. Bam Bam Bigelow, I'm interested in your comments on a potential matchup. My comments about the gang is I don't have to respect... Nothing! 
And when I get my hands on Gang, 1988, I think he's gonna go out with a bang. <laughs> I think indeed that would put you up on the contender list, a matchup like that. Is let's that what you're forget about, Let's not forget about guys like Ted DiBiase, too, with all the cash, floating the cash around. There's other guys around here, too, that we want to get our hands on. But we're gonna take them all one at a time, and in time, it's gonna be Bam Bam Bigelow emerging victorious every time because the man of flame and fire will not be denied in 1988 is going to be the year for him and the year for me. I think when you point out a guy like Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man, I have to ask you point blank as the reporter here, would you, would, could he buy you out? I mean, that's the big story with Ted DiBiase. There's offered... no amount of money that Ted DiBiase could come up with or that Ted DiBiase has to flash in front of us to put All off right. what he's you got know, coming to You might throw him. millions at you, Bam Bam. <laughs> I'll throw two million All right, him. best of luck to both of you gentlemen. It's been a big year, and I'm sure 1988 will be too. Bam Bam, Bigelow and Oliver Humperdinck. Bigelow has his eyes set on ridding the WWF of King Kong Bundy and the one-man gang, and one of those things actually going to happen here very soon. As we're back to the ring for Dino Bravo, now with manager Frenchie Martin in his corner, taking on Jerry Allen. Frenchie on the mic pre-match. Somebody should have given him some direction here because this was very generic. And with his accent, could be hard to understand as it is, though. I'm fine with the fresh start for Bravo, minus Johnny V. Is Dino going to score the win here over Jerry Allen with a folding back suplex in just 90 seconds time? Which means we have time for another matchup in this segment of the show. The Rock, Don Morocco, taking on Frankie DeFalco. We get an insert promo here from the Doctor of Style Slick, sending his men, specifically Butch Reed, after The Rock. And in the ring, it's Morocco busting out a Russian leg sweep, a cattle pult into the corner, and the tombstone pile driver giving Don Morocco the win in 1 minute and 31 seconds. As the show rolls on, special interview up on the platform, Craig DeGeorge standing by. You don't really see this often. It's Mr. Fuji and his demolition out for a special interview as the demos plan to demolish and destroy everyone in 1988. Their eyes set on those WWF tag team titles currently worn by Strike Force and anyone else who gets in their way. And I love that they let Axe and Smash get over in the mic here. Fuji had no lines. He just stood there, believe it or not, just smiled and nodded like the devious man that he was. And after only a year, demolition, just the essence of cool. They mean business and they certainly look the part. As we go off next, it's a replay from Superstars. We see the Islanders and Bobby Heenan dog napping Matilda from the British Bulldogs. And when we come back from the segment, Gorilla Monsoon continuously going off on the despicable act, but of course Bobby Hina had conveniently disappeared right before this VTR played, well-played brain there. So Bobby Hina not talking at this point as to what happened to Matilda the Bulldog, so we're going to have to continue to wait and see. Is up next, Jimmy Hart showing us an article in the latest edition of the WWF magazine featuring the Honky Tonk Man. Shill that mag, Jimmy. As it's back to the ring, one final match this year here on Wrestling Challenge, and that features the macho man, Randy Savage. What a way to go out. Randy Savage out there with the lovely Miss Elizabeth taking on Golden Boy, Jerry Gray. Insert promo here from the Honky Tonk Man, reassuring the macho man that Honky is the Gikote, or the greatest intercontinental champion of all time, if you will. Is Honky going to do a little dancing there with Peggy Sue? And it's good to see Golden Boy Gray out here, Jerry Gray in action here on WWF TV, but it's the macho man with the double axe handle out to the floor. And then back in the ring, it's the flying elbow. Going to give Savage the win. Two minutes and one second. As we close out this week's edition of Wrestling Challenge. Boy, it feels like we're heavy on the hammer this week. It's Craig DeGeorge standing by with Greg Valentine. Well, I think one thing we could say is it has not been a quiet year for my upcoming guest. They call him the hammer, Greg Valentine. It's been a very busy year, in fact. You go back to WrestleMania 3, and of course... Hammer, we know what happened there. Now, as you look to 1988, I'm wondering if it's going to be as volatile. This has been some interesting kind of year for you. This has been a real confusing year for me. Very, very confusing. You know, I used to drive out. I live in Florida. I'd drive out of the beach, and I'd stare out the waves coming in, and I just didn't know what it all meant, where my career was going, where my life was going. But now, it's 1988, and you understand it's a whole new direction well, for the hammer. a few days away from the new year, and that's something to look forward to. <laughs> oh, yes. And you know something? I've signed a new multi-million dollar contract with Jimmy Hart, the mouth of the South, the best professional wrestling manager in the World Wrestling Federation today. 
The man led me to the Intercontinental Championship in 1984-85, led me in fruitcake, or beefcake, I should say, the barber, all the way to the top of the World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Championship belts that we held in 1985 and 86. So you know something? Having Jimmy Hart right there means a whole lot. It's going to be a banner year for Greg the Hammer Valentine, 1988 because I'm going to beat everybody that they put me up against. I don't care how big, I don't care how strong, because I believe in myself. And you know, I had a lot of bad direction. I had a bad manager, I had a bad partner, then I had another bad partner, but now I'm all by myself, except for Jimmy Hart. And Jimmy Hart is not going to step in the ring and help me out. I don't need that. All I need is help to have the right match made, the right contracts put up in front of my face so I can sign them. And he's getting me those contracts. You can do that, that very well. What about some of the competition you will face? Indeed, the Barber Brutus Beefcake for you. Well, you know something? I'm not worried about the Barber. The Barber is nothing more than a stepping stone. And you know, I've been champion in the World Wrestling Federation, but I feel better. I feel, feel stronger. I feel in better shape than I ever had in my entire life. My head's in the right place. My body's in the right place. And I'm ready. For anybody, the barber, Mr. Wonderful, right. Hulk Hogan. You look back, it's been a fulfilling That's career great. for the Hammer, Greg Valentine. And there it was, the Hammer admitting that 1987 was confusing for him. Confusing year, until Jimmy Hart came a-calling. The Hammer then shitting on his past manager, Johnny V, for being bad, and having two bad partners, referring to Beefcake and Bravo. You do know that Dino is still on the roster, right, Greg? I guess he doesn't really care. Greg Valentine shitting on everyone. But the sky's the limit moving forward with his new manager, Jimmy Hart. And then we learn next week, just like superstars, it's year in review here for 1987 on Wrestling Challenge as we come to the final edition of television here in the year of 1987. It's primetime wrestling for New Year's Eve, December the 31st, hosted by Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan. It appears once again, this was taped at Caesars Palace. This time with a New Year's-like setup, some party hats, some party favors, maybe a couple glasses of champagne at times. But this is it, the final prime time, the final piece of WWF TV for 1987. And as the show rolls on, after a matchup involving the Macho Man taking on Killer Khan, Savage scoring the win over Khan, Bobby Heenan has more comments burying the Mongolian. Well, Brian, didn't work that time, did it? That green sputum didn't work for the killer, did it? Well, let me tell you something about Killer Khan. He's not that really great an athlete or wrestler. The only reason he ever achieved anything is because of Mr. Fuji. Savage just lucked out. Savage is smarter than Killer Khan and smarter than Mr. Fuji and maybe even smarter than you. You're smarter than Killer Khan. Well. The humanoids are. You remember what happened? Oriental humanoid. Remember humanoid. what happened last year, Brain? Listen, last week, I know you refused my Christmas gift. I don't I, want... I accepted that package of garbage from Miss Betty. That was that guy that... Switched it on you. I know the hairdresser. That. No, the the guy you had Please, there, the, the security guy. I tried to have a little fun with you. I had a nice big box, but it inside it was this little bitty envelope. And I'm I'm going to give you a chance to once again accept uh, this most generous Christmas gift. For That's you. for me. Yes. Second, you know, last chance. Remember what happened last year? I'll just steam it open and take a look. N at it. Never mind. Just tell me whether you're going to accept it or whether you're not going to accept no. it. What is it, a paternity? Last suit? year I gave you the beautiful gold telephone. You didn't want it. You refused to accept it. I have it home now. It's. Do you think I'm that dumb? Well, you're going to give me two good gifts in a year, in a row? That was last Forget year. it. You're I, turning this down. You know what you can do with that? I'm not stupid, my son. Well, I'll tell you what I can do with it, brain. I can put it in my pocket. I'm not ashamed to show you what it is. You know, I'm not a cheap guy. Good old Grover Cleveland, $1,000 bill, especially for you. I've never seen one of these. No, and you'll never see one again either. You're not getting it. That's it changed twice my now. mind. You've been zonked twice by the gorilla. Unhappy, aren't you? You want the telephone back? You want the $1,000 bill back? Well, You're not going to get either, Brain. You want to call somebody? You don't even have a telephone. Are you, are you here? Are you with us? It's New Year's Eve, you know. You should... You've almost ruined my New Year's Eve now. Well, you're here at Caesars. It didn't cost you, you a dime. You give me a gift, you won't give it back to me. You didn't want the gift. In front of all these people, you admitted this was my present. It was. So was the one last year. You didn't want it. You refused to accept it. Maybe you've learned your lesson. Maybe you haven't. Who knows? So, Bobby, we heard him bury Killer Khan last week on primetime. I played a soundbite for it last grenade, I should say. And here he is doing it again because Killer Khan abruptly quits. And Bobby Heenan has made it clear in, in past interviews that he was never a fan of him. There were some issues. He, he took up some issues with him in the past, and Bobby just burying him here 
on television telling Gorilla Monsoon that you're even smarter than Killer Khan. He's just an oriental humanoid. And then remember last week, Gorilla taking his gift back. So this week, Monsoon, he tries again to give Bobby another gift. Bobby quipping, what is it, a paternity suit? Heenan again turning down the present as he did last year. And Gorilla Monsoon going to unwrap the gift, open up the envelope. Why, it's Grover Cleveland, a $1,000 bill. Bobby says he's never seen one of those before. Neither have I, Bobby. Gorilla Monsoon, he probably had about 50 of those in his back pocket, though, based on the stories I've heard. And here it is, guys, the final soundbite of 1987. More news as the duo explains the rules of the upcoming Royal Rumble. You never left 50 bucks in your life. Give me a break. Talking about interesting things coming up here on the USA Network. In 1988, a big special, January 24th, a Sunday night, live right into your living rooms, the Royal Rumble. What do you know about the Royal Rumble? It's kind of like a reverse battle royal. A reverse battle royal. Yeah. Like, let's, let's say there's two guys in the ring. Every couple minutes, another guy comes down. Eventually, the ring could be full of 20, 30 people. Has this been explained to you? Do you know exactly no. what you're talking about? Yes, no, you don't. Okay. Here's what's happening, folks. There are 20 men involved in this Royal Rumble. They each have a number. Nobody knows who's got number what. We start out with number one and two inside the ring. After two minutes of wrestling has gone on, number three will enter the ring. And so the procedure continues until all 20 men have been called to the ring. At, what po- at one point, there could be, could be 15 that. men left at the end. But the ultimate winner will be the man who remains, the last man to be thrown over the top rope and down to the floor of the arena. Other interesting matches also involved here in the Royal Rumble. Ladies Tag Team Championship on the line. Glamour Girls. Against the Jumping Bomb Angels, who I think, Brain, are going to be the next ladies champions of the world. No way. No way. Can't be done. Jimmy Hart's got them keen, tuned, and they're ready. Another interesting tag team matchup, the Killer Bees against Demolition. I go with Demolition. You go with them. Why? Because uh, of Mr. Fuji? He's a very strong factor, but the Demolition, they're ready. They're Talking ready. about strong factors, let's talk about Dino Bravo, former Canadian heavyweight champion. He's going to attempt to break the world's bench press record of over 700 pounds. Do you think he's capable of doing yes, that? Yes, I do. You do? Very strong upper body. And he's a determined man. Very Not determined too much man. upstairs, though. And he's Frenchie Martin as his manager. Well, <laughs> you, you consider that a plus? I do. You yes, do. I do. It's coming your way Sunday night, January 24th, right here on the USA Network, a free attraction, sort of a uh, tribute to the World Wrestling Federation and a fan appreciation night, so to speak. Yeah, fan appreciation. Humanoid night. So there it was, Gorilla Monsoon, explaining that 20 men going to draw numbers, 1 through 20, going to start off with number 1 and number 2. Nobody knows anybody else's numbers. And then every couple minutes, a new man comes down to the ring until all 20 men have entered. Battle royal rules apply, which means eliminations are over the top rope and out to the floor, with the last man standing being declared the winner of the Royal Rumble. Now, it's also announced Dino Bravo going for that world bench press record over 700 pounds. Check. We also know the Glamour Girls going to defend their tag team titles versus the Jumping Bomb Angels. Double check. That also takes place. Gorilla also announcing that we would see Demolition taking on the Killer Bees at the Royal Rumble. Now, that match does not happen. Very interesting that it was in play, at least early on. And hey, it's a free attraction. Did I mention it's free, guys? On the USA Network, going right up against Jim Crockett's Bunkhouse Stampede pay-per-view. Fan appreciation night of sorts, of course. Now, it's also on this edition of Primetime that the Million Dollar Man, yes, Ted DiBiase, appearing at the Primetime set gifting Bobby a $1,000 casino chip. Gorilla asking, where's his? I wrote LOL for that. Also later in the show, DiBiase going to take over for Bobby Heenan for the remainder of the episode in the co-host chair, or the host chair, depending on who you want to listen to, as Bobby Heenan again wisely disappears right before we see the angle between the Islanders and the British Bulldogs. And I made a fun little note here at one point, Ted DiBiase, I caught him sniffing his money. Or it's the 80s, so maybe he was sniffing the remnants of what was on said money. And of course, some exclusive matches here this week. Three matches from the Sam Houston Coliseum. It is Randy Savage over Killer Khan. We talked about that. Khan misting spraying Savage with that green mist, confusing himself, allowing Savage to roll him up for the win. Also from the Sam Houston Coliseum, a couple of preliminary matches. Sam Houston over Dusty Wolf and Greg the Hammer Valentine defeating Ken Johnson 
with the figure four. Then we get a couple of matches aired also from Fort Myers, Florida, December the 10th. Billy Jack Haynes and Kim Patera downing the team of Iron Mike Sharp and Van Van Horn at about four and a half minutes. Horn submitting to Haynes's full Nelson. And then post-match, Demolition attacking Haynes and Patera until the baby faces eventually clearing the ring by using Mr. Fuji's cane. Patera actually breaking the cane over Axe as the heels just, they keep coming back for more. Demolition, a true force to be reckoned with here because they were not running. They were powdering out of the ring, but they kept trying to re-attack, if that's a word. Haynes and Patera here, cane or no cane, Mr. Fuji having to hold his men back. So Demolition, a true badass team. Also to close out primetime wrestling, it was Jake the Snake Roberts defeating the Intercontinental Champion Honky Tonk Man on a disqualification. Match only goes about five and a half minutes. Honky Tonk caught using Jimmy Hart's megaphone as a weapon there. But post-match, it's Roberts tying Honky up in the ropes and attempting to put Damien on Honky Tonk, but Jimmy Hart distracting long enough for Honky to escape the ring, and Jimmy gets Damien instead. So a fun little way to close out 1987. And that's it, guys. We conclude the year. 1987, now behind us. We're left with the question, what will Ted DiBiase do next in his attempt to buy the WWF title? And more importantly, what happened to Matilda? Stay tuned for 1988. And that does it. Whew, another year, another project in the books, and it feels so good to say so long 1987, but hello 1988. Yes, guys, as when I return, it is the 1988 in the WWF project. Yes, indeed, we started all over once again. But another fun memory of years ahead, and it all starts off next week with the first week of January TV. Of course, a year in review show for Wrestling Challenge and Superstars, but more importantly, it's going to be all about Saturday night's main event, the first one of the new year. And I just want to give a special thank you to all the listeners, all the patrons who have followed me all throughout this 1987 project. It's been a fun time. But it's time to move on to a new project as we continue on telling the story of the late 80s here in the World Wrestling Federation with the year of 1988. And it's going to be great. So just a quick reminder once more, guys, to follow me on social media over on Twitter at Wrestling Grenade. Also, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade and subscribe to YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And I'd certainly appreciate it, guys, if you could give that $5 all access tier a try over at Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That address again, patreon.com slash wrestle C-O-P-I-A. It's been a fun time here this week. The Hulk hogan DiBiase feud will continue on to the new year. The Bulldogs-Islanders feud is just getting going. We even got to take a look at the Slammy Awards here in 1987. They won't return for nearly a decade. So I hope you enjoyed them. But for now, this is Ray Russell saying, from pillar to post and coast to coast, you pull the pin and I'll pick up the pieces right here on the wrestling memory grenade. I'll see you next week. 1988, here we come. Don't miss it. You guys aren't going to want to miss it. Be there! Ready?